Good afternoon. Hopefully everyone can uh, see me and hear me okay. Uh, right now, it's just about 12.30, so we're going to get started uh, in the nature of time. Uh, I'm Adam Newman. I'm a partner and senior wealth advisor with Bernie Wealth Management. And on behalf of the firm, uh, we want to welcome you to today's discussion on taxes and specifically uh, the tax plan that's been uh, rolling through uh, the House and the Senate and uh, really to help address some of the major misconceptions, questions, and concerns surrounding it. So uh, I uh, want to just run over some quick, uh, you know, quick housekeeping items before we start to move through the, uh, the material. You know, the first uh, item is that this will be recorded. So if you have to hop off or uh, aren't able to stay through until the very end, don't worry. We're going to have a recording made available probably within the next 48 hours or so um, that we can email out. Um, and the second item is I'm going to uh, make use of the Q&A function uh, within Zoom. So if you notice on your screen somewhere, depending on how your screen's laid out, either somewhere on the bottom or towards the side, you're going to notice a little Q&A box. And uh, if at any time you have a question, feel free to type it in. And I'll try and monitor those uh, as we move through, uh, you know, the, the, the slides and as we get towards the end. And uh, I'm happy to answer any any questions along the way. If for whatever reason, uh, you know, I'm not able to directly answer your question, don't worry. Uh, I'm going to provide uh, contact information. You know, if you do have questions, as follow up, and we're happy to answer those on an individual uh, basis. And you know, with with all of the changes that have been happening, I'm sure all of us, you know, are monitor monitoring things at, at a different level in terms of what's floating out there in the news in terms of potential tax changes, but um, it has it has evolved you know, quite significantly. So I wanted to uh, reiterate just the goals of the webinar today and, uh, and and help lay the groundwork for what might be happening between now, really in the next you know, month, month and a half. Uh, so the main objective is to educate you on who isn't and isn't likely? Uh, who isn't isn't likely to be impacted by some of the major proposals uh, that are out there and that are realistic at this point? And that's the you know the key underline there is on proposals. We don't have anything that's been signed in the law. And at this point, if this was December 31st and tomorrow was January 1st, there would be no tax changes for next year based on uh, you know the conversations that have been had. So these are proposals, and this is just going to continue to be changing, but. I've gotten, and our other advisors are getting a lot of questions around, you know, do I need to be concerned? You know, who does this really impact? Who does it not impact? And so that's really one of the big things, uh, hurdles we want to get over uh, for today. Uh, the second is, and a, I'll give some historical context to kick things off, uh, but, you know, this is, this is not the first time or the last time there's going to be any talk of tax changes. We've seen it in the last several administrations. This administration is, is, has got a tax plan, and the next one and the one after that likely will as well. So just as important as understanding how this particular piece of legislation could potentially impact you is, is knowing uh, how, to, how to think about tax changes in the future and what tools and tips can I use to prepare and proactively plan for tax changes as they occur. Um, and, and I think the best way to do that which is the, the final goal is to help along the way draw the distinction between tax preparation and uh, and tax planning. And so, uh, you know, with that, let's work through uh, our agenda. As you notice, uh, the email address for questions is, is, is at the bottom there. It's seminar at bernie.com uh, for any questions we're not able to get to uh, along the way. So I want to start by talking through a brief history of, of the U.S. tax system and tax rates. I want to touch on one of our most most frequently asked questions over the last six months is, you know, what the tax increases, what have they historically meant for the stock market and why? We'll go through the specifics around the recent proposals, the, the, the one that's actually in writing that came out of the House Ways and Means Committee back in the middle of September. Um, and we'll talk about planning around that and planning around future tax changes uh, as they as they come and go. And so uh, in terms of, his, you know, if we go back historically and, and what's happened with individual tax rates and capital gains tax or tax rates over the last several decades, <clears throat> and this has been a political talking point 
in many directions. As you notice here, the blue line representing the highest individual income tax rate and the red line representing the highest capital gains tax rate. And I think just visually very easy to see as we move left to right, you know, from an individual, you know, maximum individual rate that at one, at one point was, was pushing 90% has fallen down to, to you know, just, just around 40%. And capital gains rates, there's been some variability, but I think they've been relatively resilient, uh, you know, relative to, to income tax rates. And so you notice, you know, for, for uh, ordinary income, a, a decline over time. But uh, what, what doesn't tell the whole story, and that's really an important piece as we look at the proposed legislation today, is, you know, this is just looking at tax rates. It doesn't factor in deductions and other pieces of the tax formula that in, that ultimately will impact what your tax bill is. So it might be easy to say that income tax rates have come down substantially, but so have deductions. You know, deductions have been limited, you know, to a, to a large extent. Um, you know, if you go back, you know, even in the 60s and 70s compared to where we are today, deductions are look and feel a lot different. So that's uh, you know one of the talking points of, of those that are in favor of raising taxes is you know we're historically in a much different position but this gives you some context if you hear about taxes going up well what what does that really compare to uh, and the other important element of this is you know when you think about the federal budget and the revenue that they bring bring in for every dollar of tax revenue that's collected where does that really come from and how has that changed over time this goes back to 1950, and it breaks down, you know, several tax categories. One being the in individual income tax, the corporate tax, social insurance, payroll tax. That's really the the Medicare and Social Security, the FICA tax that you pay uh, on your 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 ordinary income through payroll. Uh, excise tax taxes, which is you know taxes on those one off uh, one off items. You know anything from fuel to cigarettes. And even you know tanning beds have their own form of, a, of an excise tax. And finally, other, which believe it or not, is the estate tax. And for all the attention that the estate tax system gets, uh, it has historically now and has always represented a very small percentage of federal tax revenue. Um, you know, despite you know, despite all the rhetoric and the, the fact that the exemption amount has gone up substantially over the years. And I'll talk about the specifics of the recent proposal and what they're suggesting in terms of the estate tax. But uh, you know, relatively, you can see the distribution here in terms of how does, how does the government collect their, their tax revenue. So let's try and translate that to, uh, to market returns and what that's meant for the stock market over time in years when there's been legislation that has raised tax rates. So I'm not going to consider, you know, back in 2017, that was, you know, an across the board cut in tax rates. Uh, we're going to go back and look at some of the major periods where tax rates have been in one form or of another increased. And what is the market return over that period? So at the bottom, you're able to see whether this was, a, you know, an individual, a corporate or a capital gains rate hike. And then up above that, you'll see the year in which this happened, going back to 1950 through the last time that rates were increased in 2013. Which of those, you know, which type of tax was affected? You know, so for example, back in 1950, capital gains rates were in touch, but individual and corporate taxes were increased. 1968, across the board increase uh, in, in taxes at the personal, corporate, and uh, investment level. And then back in 2013, we didn't raise corporate taxes. We just raised personal and, and capital gains taxes. And you know, what does that mean for market returns in most of the cases? And obviously, just as we know, can apply this to many different things. Is there a correlation between a raise in, in tax rates, regardless of the source, and market returns? And uh, there is no clear and apparent relationship between the two. You know, you could probably look at this blindly and say, well, I guess it means every time you raise taxes, the market goes up. But uh, it doesn't always make sense to make it a direct correlation between two inputs like that. So we'll just say for purposes of this conversation and of all the things that you should be thinking about and concerned about taxes as it relates to uh, stock returns, there, there's not a strong relationship there or something that you should be taking, you know, direct or planning action around. But what you should be thinking about is 
how might these uh, potential tax changes roll into my personal situation over time? And that's what the focus of this conversation is really going to be. Um, so I'm going to come right, at, right out of the gate and talk about what's not in the most recent set of proposals. And there's been a lot of uh, subtopics that have been tossed around really for the last decade in terms of ways to creatively rate, you know, increase taxes on a certain group of individuals and companies. And, and it was it was interesting to watch to see what was and wasn't included in that final written proposal. Um, but the five things that really stand out to me are um, there's no direct wealth tax. You know, there's a certain group of senators that were really um, eyeing for and pushing for a tax on wealth, which other European countries had tried historically. And it's always been a nightmare, regardless of your stance politically on whether or not it makes sense. It's just been an administrative nightmare um, because of the different types of assets, the way that they're treated and the liquidity level. That's always just been something really hard. It's e even if someone thinks that it makes sense, sense in theory, it's just been administratively so difficult as to not implement. So a direct tax on overall wealth uh, was, was not part of the proposal. Um, the second thing uh, that was really relevant to a lot of our clients is we, we never reached a point where they were going to equate capital gains rates to uh, ordinary income levels. So there's obviously a, a, a very different uh, set of tax rules for capital gains versus income, and, and they follow the same progressive tax system, uh, but capital gains have been, for a while now, treated uh, in a more preferred way at a lower rate than ordinary income. And one concern was, are we going to make those equal? Are we going to cap? Are we going to tax capital gains the same way we tax income? And that didn't happen either. Uh, the third is direct corporate tax increases, and I know just to point out how fast this is evolving. Just late last night, there was something that came out as an idea to put a minimum corporate tax in place. That's not in writ that's not part of any written proposal. That's just one of the many ideas you're, we're going to be hearing about. But as far as increasing the overall corporate tax rate, um, that still is not the case, not happening yet. Uh, uh, fourth item would be the basis adjustment at death. So right now, regardless of your level of wealth and um, your income level, or, or, or really anything of that nature, when you pass away holding taxable assets, uh, the cost basis is adjusted, regardless of the size of the, of the gain of that investment from when you bought it to when you die, the cost basis at your death is adjusted to totally reset itself. So those with the significant gains in assets that they're continuing to hold to death and they pass away, the IRS never touches that revenue. Those gains are never realized during their lifetime. They go to the next generation, essentially, um, with a brand new, fresh cost basis. So that's been a, an absolute um, revenue loser for the IRS for as long as this, this has been in place. And this was something where uh, the tax community felt like this was the time. You know, are we going to get rid of the step up in basis or the basis adjustment at death, um, you know, in order to pay for for you know Biden's agenda never happened. So so no, uh, you know nothing there in terms of a, a, of a basis adjustments at death. And then lastly, changes to the uh, the salt cap for itemized deductions. So if you're a taxpayer right now that itemizes and you pay like most of us do, state and local taxes, um, the amount of those that you can deduct has been limited to $10,000 per year, whether you file jointly, single, uh, $10,000 has been the cap. And that has really hurt a lot of the higher tax states and their constituents have been going to, you know, members, uh, you know, their representatives and, and really pushing for that to get repealed. So where a greater amount of those taxes could be deducted. And again, one of those things you probably hear about in the news today is being floated around as an idea to throw into this bill at the last minute, um, but there's nothing there in writing at this time. So that to me, I think was the most surprising piece is a lot of the big uh, campaign items that many politicians have been camp campaigning on for a long time, uh, that didn't, didn't end up getting put into writing and, and implemented as part of this um, bill. And so uh, I'm gonna say one more thing before we dive into the income tax changes. I think the reality of this is, uh, and what will be interesting as we see something try to get passed is going to be 
you know, how tight the margins are in the uh, in both really. I mean, the House, the Democrats have a, you know, a, a several seat lead, but in the Senate, it's it's a tie. Right. And so the process that they want to use to push any tax legislation through, they need all 50 Democratic senators to come to an agreement. And so you've heard names like, uh, you know, Senator Manchin out of West Virginia and Senator Cinema out of Arizona as being more moderate Democrats, really, um, you know, uh, helping on the on the income tax increase side and putting putting their foot down in, in terms of saying we're not going to follow, uh, you know, some of these things that were in writing out of the, that came out of the House. We want to we want to come to more of a middle ground and uh, you know, a more reasonable package in terms of tax reform. So that's. Uh, that's something that, you know, if you look today, tomorrow, the next few days, as they try to wind this down, you're going to see those two senators are um, are in positions of significant power right now. Uh, but in terms of the income tax changes, so this is as I walk through, you know, what was in writing and, and what was being proposed, some, all of these might end up going through, something brand new might be thrown out there over the next several days. These continue to just be proposals. But again, the idea here is just to give us a framework in terms of what's what's been thrown out there and, and what's been it, it put put the writing. So, in the uh, House Ways and Means bill that came out on the 13th, they proposed an increase in the top marginal tax rate from 37 percent to 39.6 percent for those that file single and have taxable income over 400,000. And those married filers that have in taxable income over four hundred fifty thousand dollars. So I'm going to show the actual brackets in a second, but um, that that was the, the line that was drawn in the sand is we're going to go after those that make at these income levels or higher, and we're going to do it by increasing the top rate um, by just under three percent. So um, I'm going to look at the uh, the brackets here, and I'll pull up actually a side by side in terms of you know, what the current brackets are for singles and married filers, filers, and then directly next to it, what's, what's being proposed. And what you'll notice is up to the 32% bracket where we approach those income levels where the increases would kick in, everything remains identical, right? So, and that was, you know, really, um, you know, President Biden had said, you know, if you make below 400,000, you're not going to see your taxes go up in terms of income taxes. And that that carried through to the end in terms of the uh, proposed changes. So what you notice here is, you know, no change at the 32 percent uh, bracket or below. But you notice here two things. You notice a new 39.6 percent bracket. But you also notice that that kicks in the highest bracket kicks in at a much lower level. So the 39.6 bracket would kick in um, for single file filers at 400,000, and they would have been able to go all the way up to almost, you know, 550,000 before they hit the top bracket under the current legislation. So they compressed the brackets and they also raised them. And you notice the same thing for married filers. You know, they wouldn't have previously have hit that top bracket until almost 630,000 in income that would kick in at 450,000. So just as impactful as the rate going up by several percentage points at the top end was the fact that they lowered the level at which you would jump into that top tax bracket. So you know, the first reaction to this was this really, it, from a dollar standpoint, it absolutely impacts those that make millions, uh, millions of dollars a year. So from a dollar standpoint, they would be hit you know, the hardest, so to speak, from a from a dollar perspective. But from a percentage standpoint, those that make between four hundred and seven hundred thousand a year, from a percentage standpoint, would be significantly affected by not only the increase in the bracket, but also the compression of the top bracket. So, if you're someone that falls within that taxable income level, something that I would have on my radar is. Um, you know, are there opportunities to lower my taxable income, you know, in the year that this would take effect? Or um, is there a way to accelerate income into 2021? Because these tax changes would be effective next year. So if there's income you were expecting next year and you have flexibility to move it into this year at lower rates, that's something that I would be thinking about and have on your radar as an opportunity. Um, the other tax 
rate uh, item that was thrown in on the income side for individuals and married filers was uh, uh, the creation of a new surtax of 3% on those that make over $5 million a year in modified adjusted gross income. So we know what the tax rates are going to do uh, for those that are, you know, making, you know, just over, you know, 400, 450,000, but there's an additional surtax that would kick in on top of that, in addition to those brackets. And that rate would be 3% for married filers over, um, and, and single filers over 5 million. So that was, you know, one of the ways to sneak in a, a tax on those with significant income, which is part of the agenda. And uh, so I would say this, if you, you know, five million is a lot of money. There's not a lot of people that make five million dollars on a year over year basis. But if you have a year where uh, you're selling a business or something is happening in your life, that's a one off event that might cause you to uh, to hit this income threshold. I would be very mindful of, uh, you know, how close am I going to get to this five million number? Are there ways to reduce income to get myself below it? But that surtax is something that um, I think has some staying power. As they're talking about the billionaire tax, which we'll get to, and um, as we've seen more aversion to uh, some of the moderate Democrat senators saying they don't want to raise individual income tax rates at all. But they're open to something like this. This is this is the type of tax that I think potentially could have some staying power to the finish line and to keep an eye on. Uh, the third element of this was on investment income. So there was a uh, proposed increase in the top capital gains rate from 20 to 25 percent. And this would have been this was there's a couple interesting you know pieces of this, but I think the most interesting is that this would have uh, set to take effect on September 14th of this year. So not so retroactive that it would go back to January, but it was essentially effective the day that this, this written proposal was put out to the public. So, uh, and I'm going to show the brackets and the breakpoints, but um, it was a, it was a bump from 20 to 25 percent at the top capital gains rate, which I think is, uh, in summary, a lot lower than expected. You know, as mentioned earlier, we didn't get to the point where capital gains rates would equal ordinary income rates, which in a lot of instances would have been the worst case scenario. So it's it's an increase, but it's not it's not what it could have been. Um, however, it's going to kick in the higher capital gains rate, just like with the income rates, is going to kick in at a lower level. So um, that's you know a planning item that we'll talk about in terms of you know how not only how capital gains taxes work. But from a planning standpoint, how might you be able to manage that as we look at the brackets here? So there's actually um, several. Right now, there's three. You can argue four with the additional Medicare tax. But for purposes of this conversation, there's three capital gains rates. You know, there's a 0% capital gains bracket, a 15%, and a 20%. And the 15% bracket has been... I would say it's fairly generous in that if you're you're married now, it allows you to go up to a, a half a million dollars in taxable income before you reach the, the highest 20% bracket. But the break points are there, and you can compare that. And you'll notice with the proposed brackets, at both the single and the married level, they would kick in at lo the, the highest bracket would kick in at, at, at much lower levels than um, the, the current the current capital gains tax arrangement. So that $400,000 capital gain, um, the $400,000 taxable income level would be the break point for the 25% bracket for single filers. And then for married, it'd be 450,000. So um, the way capital gains taxes work, just as a refresher, is you take your ordinary income, whatever, you know, whether it's from, from earnings, you know, your W-2 income, any you know of your business income and uh, any distributions, you know taxable distributions from retirement accounts. You take that, you back out your deductions, and then you get a number, and that's your typically your taxable income. And then you stack your cap capital gains on top of that, and see where you fall within these brackets. So it's very feasible if someone is only living off of their portfolio and they don't have any ordinary income, um, you can. Uh, you can be mindful of those years where you actually might be in the 0% bracket and bleed over a little bit in the 15% bracket, but there's going to be years where your income is higher and lower. 
and you want to be mindful of what's the activity that's happening in my portfolio from one year to the next. How does that coincide with my other income? And um, you know, how do I take advantage of the lowest bracket when I'm in it, or how do I avoid the highest bracket or manage around it when I'm in that as well? So uh, that's something to really think about if this if this does go into effect. But it seems like as of now, for purposes of today, the uh, not the five million dollar and up surtax, but the changes in the brackets at the individual level and the capital gains tax increases seem to be like they've lost a significant amount of support. So it's very possible that this doesn't even end up going into effect. But um, just be mindful for now and in the future if that comes up and if they end up pushing something like this across the finish line. And then for business owners, you know, the last piece here on the individual tax side is for business owners to where uh, profits, if you're a business owner and you have an S corporation, profits from S corporations have long avoided um, two types of tax, and that's the, um, the, the the FICA taxes and also the uh, the net investment income tax, so the additional Medicare tax on investment earnings from uh, that was rolled out back in 2013. So if you S-Corp profits have been very uh, tax efficient, so to speak, but this new proposal would roll out an additional 3.8% surtax on those profit distributions from S-Corps at $400,000 in income for single filers and half a million in income from joint filers. And it would also limit the, the uh, Section 199A deduction for those at the same income level. So just as you're thinking about things uh, and you're, you're listening in and you're a business owner and your income hovers around these levels, you're just going to, you're going to want to try and think about how might this impact me. But as a business owner, you're afforded additional opportunities for deductions and uh, putting certain retirement plans in place that might help you, um, you know, reduce your taxable income and potentially avoid or, um, you know, maneuver around some of these increases if they come into effect. So a good talking point for us is just, you know, what do you have now? Is there anything else that's an opportunity to reduce taxation if this becomes law? Um, so moving beyond the, the tax increases, I want to highlight uh, the potential changes to Roth conversions. And I think this is probably at the top of the list in terms of client questions that we've been fielding um, because it's been put out there that some forms of Roth conversions might be eliminated. Some forms of retirement contributions might be reduced or eliminated. So there's, I think, a high level of concern around this. So hopefully I can put um, a little bit of, of this to rest. And again, this is another proposal, may or may not happen. But um, effective, you know, one piece of this was that effective January 1, 2032, so essentially 10 years from now, Roth conversions would no longer be allowed for those that are in the highest ordinary income tax bracket. So it doesn't have anything to do with your asset level, it's your income level. So 10 years from now, you're in the highest ordinary income bracket. You would no longer be able to convert money from pre-tax to Roth. I don't know how many people do that today. There's a lot of pros and cons for, for Roth conversions, depending on your overall circumstances. But typically, Roth conversions are, are timed out in years where your income is lower. So it's interesting that this would be something slipped in there. But uh, it would it would take effect in 10 years and it would, it would apply to um, those that are in the, the highest ordinary income bracket. And then second, starting January of next year, conversions of after-tax funds and retirement accounts would no longer be allowed for anybody. So this is one of the few things that we're going to talk about that applies across the board. So if you've been implementing the backdoor Roth conversion strategy in either your IRA or in your uh, employer retirement plans, that would be eliminated effective in January. So uh, that's something to where if you've been doing that this and, and you haven't fully executed on that for this year, you would want to get that in before uh, December 31st. I have a couple of questions here, so I'm going to pause. Um, oh, one here asking about the slides. Yes, yeah, we'll definitely make the slides available, no problem. We'll make sure to get those out to people that request them. Uh, so when it comes to Roth conversions, we want to time these out over, you know, the decision to convert to Roth should be looked at over a long window of time. And it should be looked at in the context of years in which your tax rates 
in your tax brackets will be changing. So those that are, uh, you know, still on their high earning years, you know, a lot of times it makes sense to hold off until you're in lower tax brackets to consider uh, converting money to Roth. And that's what is part of the overall discussion you want to have uh, and that we like to have with clients about, um, you know, when's the right time to do this. So in this instance, in the year which you're in the highest ordinary tax bracket, it might may or may not make sense um, to do it. But nonetheless, this, this slipped in here. And if you do the backdoor Roth conversions, uh, just be mindful that if this does go through and if that element passes, this will be your final year to, to, to make use of it. And um, another interesting thing here, there was a, um, an article that came out over the summer in the Wall Street Journal uh, about billionaire Peter Thiel and his multi-billion dollar IRA. And it, 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 it was posted, I think, in July. It's got a lot of traction. And it actually, I think, is the reason why this next uh, proposal got, got put in writing and got the kind of support it did. And it's um, what this is doing is it's eliminating contributions to retirement accounts for those that make over certain amounts of money, in this case, make over four hundred and four hundred fifty thousand dollars single or married filers. And if the total of all of your IRA balances, you know, across the board exceed ten million dollars. Um, so this is for IRA and defined contrib you know, uh, defined contribution plans. And if it's, you know, that $10 million limit was put in the, uh, you know, kind of put in, in place to prevent people from continuing to make contributions into those accounts at the highest income levels. But that doesn't include making salary deferrals into things like 401ks, steps, and pension plans. So it's really about just direct IRA contributions at the seven, six or $7,000 a year limit, depending on um, you know, your age. But you'd still be able to make salary deferrals. You just wouldn't be able to make IRA contributions. And that $10 million in asset level was just something that they came up and thought was appropriate. Um, and then another element was the idea that they wanted to force retired required minimum distribution on very large retirement accounts. So the same type of accounts that um, we wouldn't be allowed to contribute to, the government and the IRS wanted us to have to take um, RMDs from. So right now, when you turn age 72, the IRS requires that you withdraw a certain percentage based on your age of your IRA account every year. And that's what, that's the IRS's way of forcing a taxable event within a retirement plan. And uh, this takes it a step further and says, if you make above a certain income level and the value of your IRAs and retirement plans is $10 million, regardless of age, 72 is irrelevant in this case. We're going to make you pull money every year out of your retirement account if you meet both of these criteria. And the way that that works is if, um, you know, just for, for general purposes, if the, uh, the balance of the combined balance of retirement plans is between 10 and 20 million, you've got to take 50% of the excess of that out every year. So if you had a $15 million IRA, the excess there over 10 million is 5 million. You'd have to take a, a two and a half million dollar distribution if you also, on top of that, had uh, you know 400 or 450 thousand dollars in income. So I wouldn't get alarmed by the the 10 million dollar so much that it, that 10 million dollar needs to happen on top of uh, those income levels in the same year. So and the same there would be an additional tier that would kick in for account balances over 20 million as well. Um, final piece of the individual income tax uh, proposal was a, a little bit of an ad adjustment to the wash sale rules, which now if you sell a security to loss within a certain window of time, you can't, and you try to buy it back, that, wa that loss is disallowed on your tax return. So it's been a, you know, do you hear a lot about tax loss harvesting, you know, people selling, individual securities or mutual funds and ETFs at a loss to offset other gains and then buying it back. Um, you've got to wait. You know, there's there's time restrictions on the front and back end in terms of how long you need to wait until you can buy that security back and get reinvested. But that has been up to this point strictly limited to uh, securities, stocks, bonds, you know, mutual funds, ETFs, 
but the new proposal would expand this to other assets, specifically cryptocurrency, foreign currencies, and commodities. And the crypto thing's a big one because if you track how volatile things like Bitcoin are, um, holders of Bitcoin, as they've hit short-term sell-offs, have been able to you know, sell Bitcoin, take a loss, and immediately buy it back um, right away. And, uh, and that's just been the way the code has worked. They've been allowed to do that. But this would eliminate that and require them to wait to 30 days to get uh, reinvested. And uh, outside of the income tax piece and the you know, Roth conversion, capital gains, there's an another level of this, which is on the estate planning side of things. So what would be proposed is that effective January of next year, the estate tax, the lifetime Unified gift and estate tax exemption amount would be cut by 50%, which was already set to happen, you know, after 2025 anyway, but they would accelerate that up to 2022. So the new lifetime gift and estate exemption amount for individuals would be 6 million and then 12 million essentially for, for married couples. So again, that's, that's the piece of this that was already set to happen. Uh, in several years, they wanted to push that up and try to gain some additional revenue. If you look at earlier when we, when we talked about the source of revenue by tax type, estate tax and, and gift tax is still a very low revenue generator for um, for the IRS. But this is something I think they just wanted to slip in and accelerate um, and and just front load that as part of this bill while they could. So uh, that was already set to happen. Right now, you can give you know, gift or give away a death, almost 12 million if you're an in individual and almost 24 million if you are uh, married. So those exemption amounts, if you go back to 2021, they were well below a million dollars. And so those amounts have just continued to go up and up over the last 20 years. And uh, and this would bring it down, uh, bring it back down a little bit. Uh, so if you think about, there's three ways that the IRS that, you know, that can, can really get your money. It's, you know, on your income, on what you give away during your life, and then what you leave at death. So um, there's going to be, for, for those, and the people that I think should be thinking about this would be those that are hovering right around these exemption levels and um, might have, you know, have a very good understanding of, of what they need to live off of in their lifetime and are ready to take that next step and think about what do I want to give away during my life or at death. Um, this would be a really good trigger point to, to re reinitiate that conversation and consider some alternatives. Uh, and then the last piece on the estate side was some changes, uh, some very meaningful changes to grantor trust. So grantor trust was a way to create a trust vehicle, um, put funds in it, um, but retain some level of control and even, you know, do things like pay the taxes on it. Um, you know, you know, through your lifetime. So it was a creative way to give money uh, away, a very popular way uh, for, for someone to grant funds into a trust vehicle and then uh, retain an element of control and, 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 you know, in some cases pay the tax bill. And there are certain sales and exchanges that can happen between a grant or and the trust that were very tax advantageous. And um, this bill would eliminate, would, would eliminate essentially a lot of that. So if you have any any type of trust vehicle in place, not a revocable trust that is under your, your tax ID, um, you know, which is which is incredibly common. It wouldn't fall under that umbrella, but if you have any, you know, trust in place outside of that, um, you know, I think a lot of what's in here might trigger a, re a revisiting of that or just a better understanding of, you know, how that would integrate into overall estate planning, uh, you know, for, for the years ahead. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to touch on the, and then I'll get to some questions here that are coming in, the unrealized capital gain on, on billionaires, which is, is about two days old at this point. But because of a lot of the back and forth around those that don't want to raise income rates or capital gains rates and are really against some of these other earlier proposals we talked about, and knowing that they have to raise a certain amount of revenue to pay for this, uh, you know, President Biden's Build Back America plan. They need some way to fill the bucket with money, and this was a this was one of the ways in the last couple of days that they uh, proposed as, a, as an alternative. So, 
this would put a tax on those with a billion in assets or over a hundred million dollar and in, uh, hundred million dollars of income of the, over the last three years. So hundred million per year over the last three years and a billion dollars in assets. They're proposing the tax unrealized capital gains uh, at the current capital gains rate, which would be 20, 20% plus the 3.8% Medicare tax. So they'd get taxed at 23.8% on their unrealized capital gains. Just like the wealth tax, this could be administratively cumbersome, but they think that they're able to do this in a way um, that from a compliance standpoint wouldn't be horribly difficult. So what they'll have to do is they'll have to treat certain assets differently, um, you know, pub public versus private securities. You know, di you know, assets have different liquidity levels, different restrictions attached to them. So it would be very interesting if this does get put through as a replacement to some of the income tax hikes, how this would actually work. Uh, this would impact about 700 taxpayers in the U.S., give or take, um, and uh, it would raise a significant amount of revenue over 10 years, which is why it made its, its way through and why it's getting, it's getting some support from those that um, from some of those that were against some of the earlier uh, proposals. So um, I'm going to stop real quick for a couple of questions here that have come in. Um, is there a limit of what you can convert to a Roth IRA when you get out of your employer's 401k? Great question. So um, the, the answer to that is, is, is no. So Roth contributions have income limits. Roth IRA contributions specifically have income limits. Uh, Roth, Roth 401k contributions are allowed up to the annual max, uh, maximum, but, they're, they're, but it's not impacted by your income level. And so uh, those are the only two Roth vehicles that you have to think about dollar amounts, either dollar amounts or income amounts. But when it comes to converting money from a regular IRA or a 401k to a Roth, you're able to do that. Um, you can essentially convert your whole account. It's not dependent upon your, your asset level or your income level. So for those that uh, want to do conversions and just pay the taxes, that's something that's um, still absolutely there as an opportunity and something to do. And usually after you retire, as the question stated, you know, when you leave your employer, that's a great time to consider doing those conversions because your income is, um, is typically always lower. So great question. Um, and then one more question about um, if you live off your IRA with zero earned income and uh, yeah, how does that impact capital gains, the, the capital gains bracket you pay into? Uh, another good question. So IRA distributions are taxed as ordinary income uh, similar to a paycheck. So the first thing you do is you would take the value of your IRA distributions, total that up, subtract out your deductions. And then with that, you're left with the taxable income number. So depending on where you fall, you know, that will, you know, that level of income will get taxed at different rates. But then you put your capital gains on top of that. So whatever and your capital gains rate can actually straddle multiple brackets. So let's say for simplicity purposes, uh, and I'll go back here so we can do this in terms of an actual uh, example. Um, let's say here. You're, you know, you're married and your taxable income after you take money out of your IRA, you, you take your deductions, your taxable income is $40,000, okay? Uh, you still have $40,000 over uh, above that in terms of capital gains, you can realize and still be in the 0% bracket. And then anything over and above that, 40,000, those dollars would be taxed at 15% and you can work your way all, all the way up from there. So it's, um, it's similar in that you take whatever you know, your stated income is, subtract out your deductions, and then you've got the capital gains and the various rates that applied on top of that. So good, good question. And another timing element in terms of when, when is the best time to take gains in my portfolio versus when does it make sense to defer? And you never want, you never want the tax tail to wag the dog, so to, you know, so to speak. You don't want taxes to drive all of your investment decisions, but if you're in a transition period where this year you might have high income, next year it's going to be much lower or vice versa, that absolutely might you know, sway your decision on how to rebalance the portfolio based on how those gains may or may not be taxed. Okay, 
Uh, and that's actually a great segue in terms of, you know, so we went through a lot in terms of different proposals, and there's still the big question mark across the board in terms of what's going to happen, what's not. So I'd say the odds of us having to, to do another presentation or, or a, a blog post or a white paper is, is, is fairly high, depending on what ultimately gets pushed through and put in the law uh, before the end of the year. But uh, how should we be thinking about just potential tax changes in general, and how do we want to uh, you know, personally approach these, uh, these proposals on an individual basis? So I would say there's four things that are really important to do. The first thing is take inventory of where you are relative to these changes. So we talked about things that would really impact those you know, between four and 700,000 if they got put in the law. We talked about things that impacted those that might have 5 million in income this year. We talked about things that impact those with $10 million plus retirement accounts. So uh, figure out where you plot on that spectrum and which of these things do you really need to keep your radar on and which, is, which do you not? So that's the first thing. The second is, uh, you know, in a big piece of, of understanding their tax situation and tax planning is is understanding how they might how it might change over time so as you're thinking about where you are today also think you know where am i going to be over the next several years am i looking to make a transition into retirement is my income going to be significantly higher or lower this year next year or the year after and that provides a great uh, backdrop for a conversation around planning because once you know what what the future may look like that can help drive certain actions that you should or shouldn't take based on today. Um, and part of that is understanding, you know, what do I have control over? What do I not have control over? And one of the good things about the tax system having somewhat simplified itself a little bit over time is, you know, there's you know, certain situations and circumstances in life where you have your income, you have your deductions, and you, you know where you fall on the rates and you pay your taxes, but there's those that have higher level of flexibility, higher levels of flexibility than others. So business owners, especially self-employed business owners, um, have a significant amount of flexibility relative to W-2 earners. And then you have those that are in the middle of big transitions. You know, they have a major income hit this year, but a big drop off next year. So those are examples of people that probably have a little more control in their planning, um, you know, in the context of any major tax changes. And then lastly, um, it's absolutely crucial that you leverage and, and leverage a team and know um, who is the best point of contact for what. So a lot of this encompasses three areas. You've got your financial advisor, your tax advisor, and then your legal advisor. And it's very important to have all parties on the same page when you're thinking about taking action on any of these proposals, you're trying to plan around things like the estate tax exemption amount, or you're thinking about um, you know, uh, taking any, any type of action that integrates all three of those areas. So the, the main takeaway I would say from a, a, a relative perspective in terms of these proposals and what we're hearing out there today is definitely don't overreact. Um, there's instances where you might want to consider taking action, but I say the first thing you want to do is take this information and um, understand where you are and, uh, and, and leverage some of these points to help you start to plan between now and the end of the year. And I would say in most conversations that I have with, with, with individuals and families around taxes, I, I always try to draw the distinction, and our advisors do a really good job of drawing the distinction between tax planning and tax preparation. So I would say a majority of people, uh, they go down the path of tax preparation. You know, they, they have an accountant or they use TurboTax or an online tax tool. They enter in their data, and they, uh, they get an output. You know, they either owe money or they get a refund. And usually if you owe money, you're, you're scratching your head saying, how did this happen? And if you get a refund, it either feels good or you're thinking, why did I give the government an interest-free loan you know, for almost the whole year? So um, tax preparation is a reactive process that I think as we go through you know, either these current tax changes or those in the future, is really going to impact a lot of people and it's going in, to increase substantially the chance of, of surprises. 
tax planning is what we are you know, big proponents of and um, like to implement with our, our clients and, and working closely with their tax advisors. It's the year-round process of being forward-looking and understanding where you are now and um, not only just for this year, but for future years and how do we maximize um, and uh, you know, really limit the amount of taxes that you, uh, you know, that, that you need to pay over time based on careful planning. So you think about the last four bullet points in terms of how to, how to, how to tackle the legislation and the proposals at hand, some of those points really tie directly into tax planning and what you can do um, in, in, in working with an advisor to, to be proactive and not, not get hit uh, with, with negative surprises. And I like this, you know, this is, you know, sometimes people are visual, they like graphics. I like this little uh, you know, visual here, you know, saying really the difference between the taxes you pay and the taxes you could have paid is a lack of planning. Um, and so with that, uh, I know we've covered a lot of material. Um, I want to highlight the ability for you to speak with our, you know, if you have an advisor on our team that you work with, um, or if you'd like to speak with us uh, around a, a tax consultation and understanding where you are in relation to some of these proposals or just your tax situation in general, we'd be happy to have that conversation and um, and walk you through some of the tools that we have to help you analyze your taxes, you know, where you are today in terms of taxes and available tax opportunities to take advantage of. So uh, please utilize the, um, you know, your advisor or this email down at the bottom, seminar at uh, Bernie.com. And as I said earlier, we're going to make sure we've got a, a recording available um, and uh, we're, we'll release that and we'll also use that as a way to uh, get in touch and answer any, any follow-up questions on an individual basis. So I want to thank everyone for their time. We went just yeah, just under an hour here. Um, so I want to thank you for being patient and sticking with us and uh, enjoy the rest of your week.